Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm not an IPA snob, so. Welcome to Mike. Huh? We'll you off your own episode. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Dead Guest before. (laughs) God damn it! Can I talk? Uh, Go. Welcome to Dead Headspace. Brennan, take over. I'm not sure what I'm doing anymore. (laughs) I'm too. I'm too. You you were just waiting to get interrupted, and I was. Happened, you got thrown. <laughs> uh, hey, concurrently tonight, you guys are at today. You guys aired uh, an episode with Don Winslow, right? Yeah, yeah. And at the end, then we're sitting here talking with Mike Clark right now, and I'm Shane Douglas Keen joining Patrick McDonough, uh, Brendan LaFaro, and Erica Robin uh, in welcoming him. There you go, Patrick. Nailed it. Thank you. And that no. is <laughs> we're using that. So that that is uh that is my friend Shane Douglas Keane. He is one of the biggest influences for Brennan and myself when we started. He was on episode six, and Mike was on episode five. That came out May 27, 2020. So it is kind of like a throwback because Erica was our first um reviewer, so uh, right unintentionally on. like a throwback episode. Um <laughs> Mike, you've been on a few times since, but uh, I can't remember if it, what panel it was. I think it was the self self publishing publishing. Yeah. I can't either, but I just feel like this is like I've been never been more relaxed. You know, like I just feel like we're gonna have a good talk, and and uh, I appreciate being back. And you guys are all friends of mine, so yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, let's just uh, let's dive into it, man. Tell us about your new book. Well, it's called Hell on High. It's from Bridges Gate Press. And uh, I, um, you know, separated myself from the haunted house genre for this one. And um, I was just inspired by uh, the dead bodies that are left on Mount Everest. And I decided I wanted to, I actually had a dream. I had a dream about my wife, Frozen Solid. I used to work in a seafood restaurant. And uh, we'd get like whole swordfish in that were like frozen. And I mean, you pick those bad boys up and they're, it's like a, you know, a hundred pound baseball bat. And I had a dream that my wife was uh, frozen exactly the same. And I had to like pick her out of the snow and she wasn't moving and she moved like a frozen swordfish. And uh, I was like, you know, I've always had a fascination with Mount Everest and, um, I don't know of any other horror story except for the true horror stories that have happened on Everest. Um, and I figured it would be a great um, opportunity for me to to write something that I, I've always wanted to write about. So that's where I started. And then I added a few other things along the way. Jane, jump in at any time, by the way. Um, tell us I'm going to go to my second, my second thing that I tied it in with, which is like on the opposite end of the world. Yeah, if you want. I was going to say, All tell right. us something that you have not talked about yet pertaining to this book. Maybe there's a connection to The Patience of a Dead Man. Maybe there isn't. I don't know. Well, have you read it? The new one, Hell and High? Yeah. I only got 5% through. Well, then I'm not going to tell you. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I, I I did. I read 75%. In all I'm kidding. Yes, there is. There's a little. It's so hard to tell if you're making that up or not. I did Pat. want to know if you. No, I, I DNF that motherfucker. <laughs> I felt oh my like, god, I tried, man. It was unbearable. <laughs> I just like feel like there's some unspoken hatred that you're harboring with mostly me and Brennan. Does Patrick Brennan's just a scumbag, man? <laughs> you gotta love that. Yeah, I named I named a character in my book Patrick Brennan because I thought you were joking the first time you told us that. No. <laughs> Hello. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to put the names in there, and and um, I actually have a like I'm writing another book now, and I have my main character's name is Kendra, and I've pretty much decided I'm going to call her Erica. I'm going to go into you know find and replace and just change all those Kendras to Ericas. But uh, because I appreciate you guys, and uh, if you get killed or if you're a dirt a jerk or something, uh, <laughs> you know. It's because I'm just I'm just nudging you. Did I you think of me? It's about me that I've only ever been murdered in other people's books. You want to be in the <laughs> next one too? <laughs> Do I get to die again? 
Yeah. <laughs> I had a guy like I walked the dog in the woods and and uh, he he says, oh, my boss is being an asshole and, and this and that. And his name is J.J. Giroux. And I, I was like, OK, well, want me to kill him for you? And I, and I did. And and so he's looking forward to that. Send him a screenshot. <laughs> I, I do have a serious question. It's going to sound like I'm joking, but did you think of me? Because you typed Patrick a lot in it, and I know you specifically picked that name because of me and Brennan. So was there any conjuring of myself or Brennan in that uh, mm -hmm. process of writing? Yeah, remember, remember you were like a dick at Scares at Care? That's so awful. <laughs> yeah. I was like, who's this motherfucker giving me <laughs> drugs to yeah. make me stoned? Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to be a jerk to him. And then I saw Brennan at, at uh, you know, Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival. I was like, okay. I know where I'm going with that. <laughs> it's all tied together. Look at these absolute bastards. Yeah. I gave him a water. I don't think he said thank you. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm like, you're in the book. I didn't. I gave you the finger, actually. Exactly. This is why John yeah. Langan doesn't like you, you piece of shit. He doesn't like Brennan. Is... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's Fucking a whole thing. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. All right. So, enough of this... yeah. <laughs> no, enough of this uh, drama that Brennan causes. Mike, tell us about your book. All right. Well, you know that it's, you know, you know about the Mount Everest part of it. And then um, my, I went married to a Brazilian woman uh, named Josie. And, uh, uh, of course, I have a whole in-law side of the family. Her cousin's name is Renata. And um, she said, you know, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in northern Brazil, uh, black magic kind of stuff. And you might want to think about that. And uh, And I've been to Brazil like over 20 times, and I've spent – over a year of my life there. And um, I've seen this Macumba, it's called Macumba down there in, in practice. I've seen, I've been there on New Year's Eve. Everybody goes to the beach. It's summer down there on New Year's Eve, which is kind of hard to imagine because we're used to Dick Clark's, uh, you know, or Ryan Seacrest rocking whatever. And, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> is he still a thing, Ryan Seacrest? I don't know. Maybe you guys <laughs> I, I've only heard the name. I don't know who the fuck he is, really. So. Yeah, American you know Idol. Dick Clark, though. And he's no yeah. relation, yeah. by the way. No yeah. relation. No. no. Uh, Doesn't sound like <laughs> So, um, it, it, you know, on New Year's Eve, the, the, these um, Macumba worshippers go to the beach and they throw white flowers into the ocean to the goddess Yimanja. And um, I've also seen... Um, at crossroads, like you'll go to a stop sign or something, and you'll see this little picnic blanket with offerings and a empty bottle of cachaça, which is their sugarcane rum, and um, candles and whatever. And these are all offerings to their to their gods. And um, so, Renata, my cousin in law told me about northern brazil and how it's really bad up there and um there's a a, a faction of macumba called candomblé and if you want to look into that i i actually like was on amazon prime last night and anthony bourdain has a show about salvador da bahia uh brazil which is where my wife is from and uh, I've, I've visited there many times and he goes to a candomblé, uh, like a, a ceremony, so you can see a little bit of, of what it's like. But it's it's. I just wanted to do, do something different than Salem, Massachusetts, which is not really witches, and you know, um, voodoo or something like that. So I chose something that I know a little bit about, and then I'm like, okay, now I have to connect Mount Everest to Brazil. And um, I came up with my my heroine. Uh, my main character is a female, and she uh, her best friend goes missing, and then she finds out why that happened, and she has to uh, suddenly leave the country and leave her little sister in danger. And um, along the way, like this is another part of the book that that is um, near and dear to me. I've never. My wife was always legal and 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 never had to 
cross any borders illegally, anything like that. But I've done a lot of research about, you know, immigrants that a lot of people nowadays, they, they fly to Brazil because Brazil doesn't have many uh, visa regulations and they, they begin their journey in Brazil. And I don't know if you realize it, but there's 11 borders you have to cross to get into the United mm -hmm. States. It's just nuts. And, 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 on top of that, there's like a stretch that's a jungle that has jaguars and crocodiles and and a guerrilla army in there that deals drugs and, and they yeah. want to kill you. Not to mention the bugs and everything else that a jungle has to do with. And uh, so she basically has to get through all that, get to the United States, start saving for her sister's rescue. And then... Along that journey, she has kind of realized she's good at hiking and, and mountain climbing. And uh, and she meets a mountain climber in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. I'm from New Hampshire. And uh, he has connections. He's a rich dentist. You know, his name is um, Patrick Brennan. He's kind of an a-hole. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he has connections. He and he, he, Yeah, sorry. You love it. Come on. <laughs> and uh, he he has connections with a guy that wants to see his corporate banner flown on the top of Mount Everest. And she is uh, selected. This is this happens in like the, the early 1970s to perhaps be the first um, woman to summit Mount Everest and earn the money to save her sister. But it ain't easy. Climbing Everest. No, it's not easy. No. You know that aspect. Um, yeah, but go ahead. Go ahead, Shane. No, go ahead. You started. You sure? It. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Feels like so, you're close. <laughs> Mike, as far as the Brazil stuff, you you wrote this nice little author's note up front, basically saying, like, look, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of culture. This is my connection. This is what drove me. And, you know, you kind of went over that just now. And I wonder if uh, when you wrote it, did you kind of feel like that was a catch-all or did you have, you know, something in the back of your mind at all times? I have to get this exactly right. And, you know, was that time consuming? Was it <laughs> consuming of mental space? Um, what happened in the middle of writing it, like it's been three years since my last book and which was just the final chapter of the patience of a dead man. And my my early beta readers was like were like you know first of all it's not a haunted haunted house so it's a little bit uh, the tension of a haunted house is is not really there it's 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 different it's adventure horror and I didn't realize that at first and a couple of my my early beta readers were like okay uh, you know I don't care about Mount Everest or whatever and I'm like mm, well I need to you know make sure because I need to make sure I'm happy with it basically and. Uh, so I, I spent extra time, but in the middle of it, this controversy of a book called American Dirt came out, and I, I believe the author's name is Janine Cumming, Cummins or Cummings. Um, she was selected by Oprah Winfrey to be the book of them, you know, whatever. And uh and then she was criticized for being um not from Mexico. It's a it's a story about a Mexican immigration, and like there's a gang shooting. And um, they have to escape Mexico. Basically, there's a lot, there's a little bit of controvert uh, commentary about the Mexican government and policies, and some about skin color. And it kind of erupted online, and I was like, "Oh my god, I'm a gringo!" Because my wife calls me a gringo all the time. <laughs> and uh, and she's correct. About... <laughs> I'm pasty AF. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But so I, I started to like I I had better get this exactly right, you know, and and I'm not, and even if I get it exactly right, I'm still gonna piss some people off. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but I had the blessings of of my in laws, and um, I also like made sure. I mean, there wasn't any Brazil commentary because I really love Brazil, and um, I just wanted to make sure that. I didn't punch down or all, whatever the sayings are about like, you know, picking on a culture because I just wanted to set it in a different 
setting other than Salem, Massachusetts or whatever, you know, I mean, how many Salem, Massachusetts stories have we seen? How many voodoo things have we seen? I don't know crap about New Orleans and voodoo. I've been there for like a day and a half of my whole life. But I've been to Brazil for over a year of it, you know, um, not the northeast part where the, you know, I actually looked up a an, an original, not an original, um, uh, a real life story that happened in northern Brazil. And I kind of adopted it to to this. Um, and uh, the real life story was worse. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to change the setting. I don't I think the number one thing I want you to come out with after you read my book is like that was different and it was still good you know like it was i didn't know where it was going and that's that's where i was coming from well and I, yeah i think it's effective too i mean honestly one of the things that thrills me the most about this book is that it's not anything you've ever written before you know and that's important to me when i think about that i think about like josh mallerman who every book he puts out is a totally fucking different thing. Even if mm. it's like the difference between Bird Box and Mallory, they're still entirely different creations, you know, and they're entirely different types of stories. And um, I think as an author, that shows you growing more and more, you know, and you're already a great, a great talent. Um, and the ability to stretch into different worlds and to put yourself in those places is pretty, pretty effective, you know, and then you couple it with that idea of this person who made the trip from Brazil to the U S you know, going through all that shit you have to go through to do that across those borders and, and then get across our border, you know, where the real monsters are, you know, and um, it's, it really makes it effective that then, you know, you would select that person to go on to climb Mount Everest, because if you can get here from Brazil, you can probably walk up that fucking mountain, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like that, the Everest was probably not the hardest part of that, you know, like yeah, there yeah. are some people don't make it through the immigration thing through those 11 countries. Yeah. They are, yeah. they are enslaved, you know, and exactly. Uh, it's just it, that, that that actually, I read a, uh, a book and I can't recall it off the top of my head. Um, and I probably should have. I just read. I, I read a book and then I watched a. You know, I hate to say I watched YouTube videos and and that kind of thing, but I did. Um, if you ever want want to watch like a look for the a CB, go on YouTube and search for CBS Darian Gap Darian D A R I A N. And you see, like, real-life people, like, there's a guy from Iran that flies to Brazil, and he's got to make it through. And, you know, as as uh, Americans, we were, were, you know, bred to kind of like, oh, Iran, uh, you know, that guy's an a-hole, and he he hates us and whatever. You see it. You see humanity in this, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what you see anywhere you go if you travel or um you know it's not the news and it's it's humanity and um i hope that came through in this because um it, it's a soft spot for me you know I, I think that i mean i would definitely cross the border illegally if i were hungry or in danger or that kind of thing i mean just it's you know it's a it's a terrible problem and it's all tied up in politics mm -hmm. Absolutely. Erica, we have not heard from you yet. Throw something at Mike. Oh, good. I feel like I already had an opportunity to ask him a lot of questions on that Facebook Live event. <laughs> they don't know that, though. Just That's the true. Same That's thing. true. Yeah. Different listeners. Um, <laughs> He's ready for those ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I guess just on. touching on all the different elements you have in this book, like even from the smallest things like the bugs, like you made that so terrifying just knowing that like if you get too many bug bites you could have issues or the big things like climbing the mountain or crossing the borders or running from people with guns all that stuff um was that something that kind of just like came to you naturally as you wrote the story cuz i remember reading it the first time and i like <laughs> had such a physical reaction to every little step of the way and i was just like oh my god this can't get 
that much scarier, can it? And it, it kept getting scarier for me. So yeah, what was your writing process? I'm glad like? it was scary because like it was hard to keep the tension going uh, in, a, in a, an adventure horror because, you know, you're not at the top of Mount Everest the whole time. But um, yeah, one thing I've like read in a bunch of reviews is like like atmospheric, you know, kind of a thing. I didn't know anything about, you know, mountain climbing or, you know, jungle or whatever it is. And um, I'm starting to think like, yeah, that's what I, I'm always going for. I want the reader to be in the position of that person. And I guess maybe every writer would want that too. Um, but atmosphere is everything to me. Like I really need you to feel what I'm feeling when I write it. And I'm not going to write it if I don't feel it kind of a thing. Like if it, I just, I don't know. That's why I'm writing. That's why I'm writing to, to put, fear on the page and one thing you left out in that little you know intro there is avalanches <laughs> which you talked about in the other show um okay. yeah like i spent like a day and a half or whatever like searching for you know somebody that survived an avalanche because i didn't know what what it, what that would be like you know is is um is it dark under the snow or is it light under the snow and and what happens you know and i finally found a story about this austrian like ski um ski lodge employee or something that was doing a morning run and avalanche overtook her and she was you know all of a sudden she's immobile under the snow her cell phone is ringing it's in her you know her her uh breast pocket of her of her of her jacket and she can't touch it her arms are frozen in the snow you know like wherever they are and she could be upside down and backwards and that kind of crap just scares the hell out of me you know yeah and, me too yeah so like that i absolutely i don't start writing a story unless i feel the goosebumps of something and uh i definitely feel the goosebumps when i see a mount everest story or i mean let's say you're you could watch a hundred videos of you know, whatever, whether it's on YouTube or whatever, and people are looking at the summit of Everest, and you look at that thing, and it's got, it's got a plume of snow blowing at a hundred miles an hour, going off to the right or the left, or whichever way the jet stream is hitting that mother, and there are people up there at the same time. It's just nuts, and, and it's not easy to get to. It's right there, but you ain't getting there. I mean, unless you risk your life and that any place that's hard to get to like a sunken ship or a, you know a, uh the top of a mountain or something is creepy to me i agree um go ahead mm -mm. me okay so so what is it, what's your takeaway what is your takeaway after writing this uh what how do you compare it to uh your takeaway after writing the trilogy not it doesn't have to be an entire three book uh, entries could just be one of them but how's it how does it make you feel as a writer i feel like a weight is lifted off my shoulders i feel wow. like i feel like i um i didn't expect to feel it during writing it but i felt like i felt like i let down my early beta readers and then i took it to well read beard he gave his input. I really revamped it. And Bridget Skate had a awesome editor in MJ Panky, who um, called me out on a few things that needed calling out on, and um, kind of like put a couple things together that I never really did. Like it was, you know, obviously it's a crazy story where you go from Brazil to the United States to the top of Mount Everest, and. I had a little trouble along the way. It took three years, but you know, those first, those early beta readers were kind of like, I was, you know, crestfallen is the word, you know, like, Oh no. You know, like I, I consider this my sophomore effort, you know, like it's my fourth book, but the first three were one story. So now that I, I took my time, I waited I did it the way I wanted to do it. I finally learned to do that. I had all that imposter syndrome and all that stuff, you know, like people might, you know, want to pigeon, 
pull you or whatever you into into a certain thing. Now I feel like I can write anything. Like I grew up on Stephen King. Um and I don't know if you saw on on, uh, on Twitter, but I met him forty years ago the other day. Still and, bragging uh, about it too. What's that? Still bragging about it forty years ago. I'm still gonna brag about it, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I got to meet Stephen King. I, I, he was uh, Christine had just come out, and uh, I was seventeen, and I, I'm waiting in line, this huge line, and what am I going to ask him? What am I going to ask him? And and then I finally asked him, like, well, what's your next book? And he told me about Pet Cemetery. And I'm like, that that doesn't sound good, you know, to myself, <laughs> but it's my one of my top two of his. Like, I love The Shining, <laughs> and I love that one. Um, now I got myself off track. Pet Cemetery is a good movie too. Which one? The, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I haven't seen the new one, so I. The can't new one is the same damn thing. All right. They well, just changed the girl for the boy. Well, yeah. I've seen only the old one. I'm just saying of his remakes or adaptations uh, of his adaptations, it's one of the good ones. No, it is I, good. I, I like the both original. of those books. Yeah, Christine and Pet Cemetery both got made into great movies. Yeah, the originals. Yeah. John Carpenter did Christine. Mm-hmm. I got yeah. into that. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where was it? Just like, you, like... you can't say I got off track because Patrick takes that as a personal challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> did I answer the question though? I, I, I'm. I don't even know what the question was, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> So why don't we ask a question that was uh, asked on Twitter? Brennan, you got that prepared? Just I kidding. don't. Was that the was that the one where Mike asks for Mike's social security number? Is that, <laughs> what? Is that the one we're looking oh. for? <laughs> no, LJ <laughs> LJ Doherty. I'd like to know uh, Mike's thoughts on the critically underrated mountain climbing film Vertical Limit, starring Chris O'Donnell and Robin Tunney. Good thing I saw that. <laughs> because I don't really like that movie. Um, it's kind of like it's almost like uh, what was uh, Stallone's Cliffhanger, where they like <laughs> yeah, I never watched that like one. an action movie or something. And uh, so, no, there, I think there's an explosion in that movie too. Like why, you know? So I'm gonna just I'm gonna say no to that movie, mm. and I'm gonna uh, suggest four more that are good. And one of them I just watched, um, I think it's on Hulu. It's called Summit Fever, and it takes place in uh, France. And it's got Ryan Phillippe in it. He's not the main character, though, because I don't really like that dude. And uh, (laughs) What do you got against him, man? Uh, It's just kind of dry, you know? Okay. God bless. But uh, (laughs) I know he's not going to make my movie now. But... uh, yeah, Summit Fever is very good, and it's like it's based on a true story. Okay, another one if you haven't seen it is Free Solo, which is like a documentary free, uh, uh, true story, and it's about a guy that climbs uh, El Capitan in Yosemite National Park with no ropes. Mm-hmm. Nuts! That's uh, fucking an- crazy, man. <laughs> it is. I mean, like he does, he has to do like a jump at one point, you know. Yeah. Um, another one is the Dawn Wall, and um, that's a true story too. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I won't go into that. For, that, but that's awesome. And then, um, touching the void is another true story. Um. Where like one guy slides off the mountain, the other guy, you know, catches him, and he's got him by the rope, but they can't do anything about it. They can't. One guy's not strong enough to pull the other guy up, and the other guy can't reach the rocks or anything to get up, and <laughs> one guy has to let the other guy go. <laughs> and awful. it really happened. And he it's falls not- into this like cavern, you know. And I, I I'll leave it at that. Not a mountain climbing movie, but Frozen, not the animation animated one, but Frozen. <laughs> uh, Adam yeah, Green. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Adam Green. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Get two two skiers get stuck, stuck on a ski lift and uh, eventually 
oh, they're yeah. forgotten. Yeah. And they have wolves that are very hungry for them. <laughs> and and the ski uh the ski lift is uh the ski resort is closed for I think the weekend, something like that. Something where they're closed for a few days. So they're stuck up there and gotta figure out how that's isn't it Massachusetts you know? too? I don't know. I think it is. And I, I actually met a guy that was a cinematographer for that, like met him online. And um and I don't think there's wolves in Massachusetts, but it's a good movie. I liked it. I feel like there's wolves in West Massachusetts. Maybe. Well, you don't know that, though. You're just saying you feel like it. I'm looking at it right now. There have been one, there's been one confirmed wolf sighting in the state since the 1800s. Wow. So, yeah. Fake. Movie, movie fake. Movie fake. Yeah, I don't no, think Frozen. I, I've, I've seen that movie twice. I like that movie. It's good. I just can't escape the thought that Pat kind of looks like that little snowman dude in Frozen now that he mentioned that movie. Just <laughs> Olaf. He does like a little <laughs> yeah. I'll be the foul mouth version. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look, my balls are frozen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Mike, Wonderful. what's uh <laughs> like you've done done a few podcasts talking about this book now. What's what's like a theme with uh you know, readers, um, interviewers, what's the thing that they usually talk about with you? To you, not with you. About the book? Yeah, uh, about the book. Um, I, I'm just very happy with the way, like, I was worried about it because it's, you know, like I said, it's a, like a sophomore effort kind of a thing. Um, I took my time. I, I, you know, made sure I was the way I liked it. And even if it's not, I mean, like even Stephen King wrote Firestarter, which I, I do like, but I don't like it as much as some of his others. And and I'm I'm kind of learning as a, as an old man and a young author that you know they can't all be, um, you know, The Shining or or Pet Cemetery or whatever. So, um, I don't know. Like I don't think that I've found like a theme yet. There's only been like twenty something reviews on Goodreads or something. Uh, I think I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm over four, six something or something, you know, for stars. And, and I hate to measure by stars, but it's better than I, I hope for. You know, like I thought, like, based on my beta readers, that this could be, you know, the end. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I put I did put my heart and soul into it and tried to deliver uh, entertainment and you know, you don't know where you're going with it. So um, I don't know. I don't think, Pat, that there is a uh, a theme, you know? I mean, it's a crazy story. I don't think anything's been written like it, 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 it unless it's a true story, you know? And, and I added black magic into it, so, and supernatural elements. So I think it's unique. And, and I was even asked by uh, <clears throat> um, William Sterling, the the author on, on Twitter, like he... You know, he wants me to be on his podcast and he he talks about tropes and that kind of thing. I go and I kind of stink at like the classic. Um, I'm not classically trained on horror like a lot of you. I mean, I I'm old enough to have seen ha Halloween and Phantasm and Dawn of the Dead and the thing in the theater when it came out. But <laughs> you know who the hell Cthulhu was, you know, like a couple of years ago. Uh, so. That's all right. I didn't either. But, I didn't know what Lovecraftian meant, all that kind of stuff. You know, like I just like horror. And it's I'm a kind craft of... where you make love. <laughs> Somebody Dude, mute him. Let me write that down. Dude, you're out of here. <laughs> Eric, can you take over? <laughs> Was that serious? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, like, we're okay. just getting silly now. Sure. Get um, us back. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. Kind of just going back to my a comment you had about stepping away from the haunted house into the adventure horror. I know your book is like still very freshly out, but I was curious if you have your eye on another subgenre, if you will. You can take that like very broadly because I too like I don't really care about putting stuff in neat little boxes like yeah I don't either. or whatever. Yeah, I don't think of it that way. In fact, I didn't even know that Patience of a Dead Man was a haunted house until you know like 
day before yesterday. Like it, it is, but I don't just don't think that way. And um, I guess Hell on High is adventure horror because it has to go somewhere. But um, I didn't think of it that way. I thought of dead bodies on Everest, and I thought of um, you know putting it in Brazil too. Um, but yes, I started another one, and I don't know. Hmm. I don't know what um like it, I might spoil it if I told you the what it would fit under. Um but hmm, you know it, it here's the here's the premise. Um there's a woman. Uh oh, what happened to Shane? He got sick of your shit here. and left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Um, alcohol is more important than you right now, Clark. That's okay. <laughs> I, I understand. So I um, there's a uh, oh, people are hanging themselves, and this one does take place in Salem, Massachusetts. And um, there's a, a woman that lost her babysitter the same way uh, years ago, and she starts putting two and two together and realizing that. Um, is Salem cursed? You know, is it? Does it have? Uh, is it the the innocence from the Salem witch trials? You know, continuing this curse and making people hang themselves, or is it something else? And she starts to write a column for the newspaper, which is the Salem News, Salem Evening News at the time, and um, which is Paul Tremblay's hometown newspaper, and. Um, it goes from there. So yeah, it's it's a little bit of like, you know, she has she's like a little bit of like investigative and uh she thinks she sees ghosts of her dead babysitter. And um I'm only halfway through, so that's all I know. Well that sounds awesome so far. <laughs> so if you have it take place in stone, you can actually pull uh Devil's Rock in that little world of yours. Uh Stowe? Huh? Is it Stowe, you said? Stone. Oh, is it Stone? Yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't read that yet. I just I just bought that though. I bought us like a special edition. It's right over there. And uh like You said a... Paul's hometown. That's where he's from. No, he's from Beverly. Paul Tremblay? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I just said I'm sorry. Oh, he lives in Stone. <laughs> I know he's lived in Stone forever. <laughs> He's from Colorado. No, he though. he lives in Stoughton. Yeah, he lives in Stoughton, but he's from he grew up in Beverly. Okay, I know. Which he's from is Colorado. also in the Patience of a Dead Man, or no, maybe Dead Woman Scorned and Anger as an Asset, and it's also in Hell on High, Beverly, Massachusetts. I know that uh, coincidence. I, I, I knew he's from Colorado and grew up in Mass. I, I know he's in Stoughton for a long time. Yeah, no, he does live there now. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, Erica, why don't you continue? Mike's starting to piss me off. <laughs> oh, no, that was the answer. Bring it though. on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, seeing Mike, going back to him, talking about scares of care, seeing him in person was just like just meeting your friend that you've known forever. That's how, that's how I feel. Like, you know, like we haven't seen each other since that was 2021, but I feel like we're brothers. I feel like we are. Know, we got a little not yeah, sober. I, I'm, I'm poking <laughs> just... jabs, and if you don't get those jabs, <laughs> you should. You just you just know, not sober and uh, joking around the whole whole night. I'm sober, I'm just happy. No, not what? No, not now. I'm talking about scares of care. Oh, it kind of uh, goes I was, back. To I was sober the then too. <laughs> Sorry, Shane. <laughs> What's up, Shane? No, you're fine. <laughs> no, that was hilarious, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just having fun over here. No, I don't. I was just saying it kind of goes back to the dynamic with all of us, how we first encountered each other and how it was just kind of like right out the gate. Well, fucking like me or don't like me, but this is what I am. And I think that's why we're all comfortable together now, you know, because that's just how we just how we roll. Known each other for like, what, three years, four years? Yeah. 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 It was 2019, I think. So four. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. There's been quite a few podcasts that have come and gone. And same with authors, and it's just real interesting seeing that because Brian Keene, I heard him talk about this when he had his podcast. He's like, oh, "We've been here long enough to see 
which writers that are new that you can probably say, eh, they're not going to be here for a while. I feel like mm -hmm. we're all at that point, you know? Yeah. Just patterns. Yeah, well, I'll yeah. tell you, you know, like, I, I understand that, too, because you don't know if you're going to quit. I mean, there's no money in this crap. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you got to do it for love. I mean. Well, and yeah, and when you're someone like, like me and I think like you who published their first fucking work at 55, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, you really need to love this shit to keep fighting it, you know, while you're also getting cataracts removed and working on your hemorrhoid problem and whatever the fuck else you're dealing with. I don't with, have a thyroid. Know? <laughs> not yet you don't no, it's gone they took it no thyroid oh, yeah, they, I had my throat cut last year oh there. no thyroid yeah, yeah. Um, well yeah because they, they were doing a surgery on my spine and they accidentally cut an artery and they had to oh. hack back in and fucking oh, sew me God. up and, yeah they fucked a lot of shit up oh my <laughs> God. I have a doctor's appointment for ear nose and throat tomorrow Like life is good yeah, it is. <laughs> and that was that was the old fucker's edition of <laughs> yeah. what hurts in the morning. <laughs> right? Oh, what doesn't hurt? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I need to start and, something and... there. <laughs> Brennan, save it. No, I saw I saw Brendan, he put he, he you know, we're doing this thing on Twitter with like show us your age or whatever, show us a picture in your age, and Brendan's 37 and I'm 57. And I'm like, well. <laughs> Old enough to be his dad. Yeah. True. Yeah. All right. I don't know. I my kids are <laughs> I, a lot. I want to throw out a question to Mike. Um, and I'm I'm gonna try to do it without insulting anybody or you know, throwing jabs or something. A serious question. So you talked about, you know, the whole beta process and you know, sending this book out to people and almost feeling kind of disappointed because the general reaction was it wasn't what they expected to come from you, which I mean, on the surface, I get that reaction, but it's not a bad thing because it means that you're stoking that variety. So I wonder, having kind of, you know, taken advice from here, there and everywhere and eventually cobbled, cobbling together the book that you wanted to write. Did that change your approach when you're starting this new book, when you're writing now? And you realize, you know, I can certainly trust my beta readers. I can take the opinions of people, but ultimately I'm going to write the book that I want to write. Is that, yes. does that change the way you're writing? Yes. It? Yes. I have much more confidence now. Like, I feel like this was a transition and I'll always love this book for that reason. You know, like I, th I think it's a good book, but I also feel like it gave me permission to, you know, to, to have a fire starter, to have a Christine, to, uh, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, if I should be so lucky, you know, I don't mean to say that it's going to be that successful, but um, it doesn't have to be a haunted house every time, you know? And, and if I did write a haunted house, what would people say? I like the other haunted house better, you know, or right. I like this haunted house better. So mm -hmm. I kind of, I've always grown up like listening to music and, and, you know, your band changes their sound, your favorite band. And, and then you're like, um, God, why does your album sound so different? I like the other one so much. Why, why doesn't it sound like Highway to Hell or whatever? And it's it like, you know, and, and ACDC is not a really great example, but like one of my favorites is Stone Temple Pilots. Mm. And their first three albums were like, the first three albums were all different. And, but you got to love them all because they were just doing what they wanted to do. And, um, you know, I'm glad they did it because otherwise it just would have been puddle of mud or whatever, you know. People get confused. How I feel. Go ahead. You start I was gonna it. say I was gonna say that people people seem to get confused or forget the fact that like uh, how do you just view them like they're your friend? Your friend isn't like like all of us have known each other for three years. We've evolved in different ways. We all get you know whether we want to or not, good and bad experiences all kind of change us and help us evolve we've all right. had shitty friends and that helps us become stronger in another department and grasp onto someone else stronger but my point is is with bands they're, they're gonna evolve they should yeah mm -hmm. and writers and should writers too, too. Yeah. yeah exactly and you were mentioning shane i want to hear you go off on this because i know what a big fan you are mallerman you, you talked about it but 
you've been reading him since Bird Box first came out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, so, yes. Yes. So hearing a hearing an original reader, yeah. I'm, I feel like yeah. very few can say that. So l- let's hear let's hear you talk about him. Well, I got I was fortunate enough to read Bird Box as an as a arc reader, um, way way early on, you know. So and and his publisher put those arcs out way before the books come out. I didn't know that you got to read the arc. Yeah, yeah, that's and, awesome. Uh, um, it. Uh, I was so at first when his next book came out and I don't have a good enough memory to remember the order of things at first I was really disappointed because it wasn't Bird Box or a Bird Box sequel because this guy was so fucking unique but then I realized yeah this guy is so fucking unique you know (laughs) and I read you know the next book and the next book and the next book and almost all of them as arcs and that's not bragging, it's just proud is all that is to be a, have that honor, you know. Um, and every single book was different than the one before. And I realized as I got more into him, more into Joe Lansdale, more into Jonathan Jans, you know. Um, um, and, you know, you think about people like Caitlin Kiernan or Poppy Bright or, you know, a zillion other people. And what they've done is they've normalized diversity among their works and i think that's a great fucking thing to do i think that's you know i would why i was happy when i saw that this book was so different than the uh is it miriam black sorry my name my memory is shitty the first uh the first trilogy of mike's you know i was like i'm thrilled that this is so different because i think the better authors in this genre normalize difference you know, mm. King, King does, Koontz does, you know, um, Mary Shelley certainly did, you know, <laughs> um, or, and, uh, um, I mean, just, there's just a zillion examples you can go to, but my favorite authors all write different books every time. Neil Gaiman, Peter Straub, uh, right. Bradbury, Straub. Mm-hmm. Matheson. I mean, he wrote a Western, she wrote war yeah. books. Yeah. Real hard. I catch them too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. this is lots the stuff I missed out on too. Though. Like I, I'm not that well read. <laughs> I, I wish I knew. Uh, you know, I wish I was as well read. But now I'm at an age where I don't have time. You know, to yeah to yeah. catch up. And I'm just gonna do. I'm just gonna follow my heart. I guess. Go at uh, your own pace, baby. Catch up. I gotta. What's that? Go at your own pace, man. Got to do it. You're, you're never going to read. Like, I would love to read Joe Landon Steele's entire bibliography. But, like, right. that's that's not going to happen even if the podcast wasn't a thing. Like, yeah. You know, just for one example, never mind Catchem or Bradbury or, or anyone else. Brian tried to you read know? all of Brian Keene's books. Did that even work out? I didn't make it. I got like 60%. <laughs> and then I got fell behind for all the books I did yeah. for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How do you guys uh, do that see, with kids? I mean, like you have kids and you and you. Right. Oh, them. we just ignore them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Send them. Send them to the neighbors. <laughs> uh, no, I. I am fortunate enough that. Uh, I mean, not fortunate enough that I'm fucking ancient, but the fact that I'm ancient and I've been an avid reader since I was like six. Um. Most of the guys you mentioned, I've read just about everything that they've written. And so, you know, that's a, one of the fortunate things about being an old fucker and having lived through the 70s and 80s when horror was in its first heyday. You know, um, it's also in one now. So, you know, make no mistake about that. Horror is alive and well. Um, but, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be alive. And, you know, whenever I was lucid and not on some kind of drug or another was reading 100% of the time, most of the time. So, you know. I feel like I've had to catch up to the readers. Like I I was, I was a reader at at a young age and then I, (coughs) more movies and then, you know, then I video, you know, I got off the track and and I lost ground. But um, yeah, and I think that's a difference too. Is that I've never been a visual person. I don't. I don't watch a lot of movies or TV. Or I, I selectively do. You know, uh, but I've always.
always been, I've always leaned to the written word. Um, but anyway, this is your episode, Clark, not mine. Tell me to shut the fuck up and tell us. No, no, it. no. I'm, I'm happy to share. Up? Happy to share. I just want to talk more about Patrick Brennan. He was a dickhead in my book. Patrick <laughs> Brennan is a... You know, I hate this guy. <laughs> I mean, the guy, the guy sucks. I mean, yeah. Mike, Mike, I think the longest chapter you wrote in this book was like, you know, five pages. And it seemed like the, the ones with Patrick in it were, you know, half a page to one page. And you got one in, you're like, oh, my God, like, wh yeah. what a what a jack off. Right. Well, watch your <laughs> mouth there, Brennan. <laughs> no, it's also it's also, though, uh, what really intrigues me about it is the short razor sharp characters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That, Sorry, was, that, that was on you of, misreading. I, that that's by mistake, too. You can't even hold me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do that by mistake. I make an outline and I just go, okay, I have to write about this now. And I go, oh, oh well, that's about all I have. And I'll just go to the next. Uh, mm -hmm. But some people, I, I think I've gotten a few reviews that are like, it's too short. You should have just put a line, you know, or, or whatever. It just kept going. And food for thought, you know. Sure. Food for thought, but I think it's also in the same conversation as, to a degree, this novel should have been a novella. This novella should have been a novel. It's like, Absolutely. well, okay, but mm -hmm. I was, I, but, but I wanted to write a novel, or you know, yeah. I, yeah. to me, this story was busy enough to take up, you know, more than two hundred pages, or to me, this story was paced in a way that, that the way I wanted to tell it wound up at you know thirty thousand words. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's validity in it if, you know, if you want to put stock in those opinions and if they're widespread, but at the end of the day, you're writing it. And if you want short chapters, then make those chapters fucking short, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I think, really? I think I, I, I will continue to write short chapters, but I yeah. might put that line in a couple of them. Yeah. Those short chapters massively ramp the pace up. It was a, it was a technique. Ketchum used extensively, and so did J.F. Gonzalez. Um, and they just make books read like rocket ships. I know. loved, I you know, I read, I read, I couldn't get through it. The the girl next door, but I actually, I just read, yeah. I just yeah. ordered his first book today on Kindle. Jack Ketchum, his his writing is as smooth as butter. Oh yeah, yeah, he was one so of the good. greatest. I think. Yeah. I look forward All to reading more, but he was so now. it was so strong. It was so that story was so disturbing because the freaking main character got sucked into the, mm -hmm. the mind think, you know. I, I couldn't I couldn't do it. But it has nothing to do with the writing. No, it no, it took me three shots at it before I finished that book. Uh, and it was worth it. But it's a hard book to read. It is. It's really disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, especially when you start to take into note, you know, the fact that it's based on a fairly, fairly accurately close to a true story, too. So that's scary. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Mike, would you pursue something like this again? Not specifically mountain climbing, but would you pursue, say, I don't know, whatever the topic is, and you're like, well, don't know a fucking thing about that because often we'll hear, write what you know, but how can you write anything new if you don't research it? So I, I guess that's an open-ended question. No, it's a good question, though. I get it. Um, hear that, Brennan? As you... <laughs> no. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> no, I want to write an addiction horror movie uh, book. Ooh. Like I am horrified, terrified by people that use heroin, and I've never used heroin, but I think it is the scariest thing on on earth. Like it's a real thing. Yeah. And in the in the last uh, six months, like I got for some reason I got drawn into the music of the Screaming Trees, which is a '90s band, like a grunge band from Seattle, and they were friends with. Nirvana and uh, uh, Alice in Chains and so forth. And the singer, Mark Lanigan, has written a couple of books. And he uh, and his dealer wrote a book. <laughs> uh, 
his I'll, I'll just give you a little you know anecdote um the dealer in his book he goes to go, uh he he shoots heroin in his arm so much that it's they develop abscesses and the muscle eats Shit. away and it's like a hole in your arm Ugh. and and then like this like he's got to wipe it with like a it's gross but he's got to wipe it with a tissue right and then leave it on the floor and in the morning these tissues are like crystal flowers you know of like bodily fluid just like they're hard and gross right and i'm not going to write that part but but <laughs> this is reality and you should he gets yeah. in a car to you know put it in reverse and back up and he cranks the wheel and his arm breaks because he's shot oh. heroin so many times into that bone that oh. it can't handle anymore I was kind of hoping the abscess would explode in his face. That would be awesome in the book story, right? You want to read the book? I'll tell you what the book is. It's, <laughs> it's even worse than that. This guy is in such bad shape. Holy shit. Yeah. So, no, I'm not, it, I don't want to write a gross book. I, I want to keep the female readers. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. And, and I know my wife would like be like, you know, get the get the hell out of my bed. But yeah, I, know, I, know some, I know some female readers who would read the shit out of something like that. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot that writes some pretty crazy shit. Candace, yeah. Nola, and Judith Sonnet, to yeah. name two. Christine Morgan. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Kenzie Jennings. Yeah. But if you remember the, in my in my third book there, uh, Anger is an Acid, it, it's, it's the character uh, Andrew who who has like a drug problem and his his mother kind of haunts him and um uh, and uh he i want to give him a worse drug problem than i gave him the first time around <laughs> <laughs> my second wife gave me a worse drug problem than my first wife did so <laughs> yeah, i can give you some pointers if you need <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was so hey, if you know anybody that's been addicted to heroin i i probably need to talk to somebody because I, I have questions yeah well you? contact me bro yeah honestly I'll send you my, yeah i'll send you my numbers oh okay we will talk yeah, yeah yep, i'm all i'm old school junkie man it's been a long time but i can i can show you the ropes definitely yeah no <laughs> I, I will definitely contact you all right i mean it's gonna be a while but i'm gonna write but that yeah when you're ready i'm i'm willing so all right like you said you. a joke and i it was the only one that got it showing the ropes yeah <laughs> <laughs> i got dark I there sorry <laughs> exactly no i that's where i was going too but you are the only one who actually picked up on it. like oh, Clark I'm actually going. Said, thank you <laughs> <laughs> anyway all yeah, right good no, night I'm folks really yeah, uh, that's it. We're out. Yeah, that ended it's pretty dark. <laughs> so I'm looking towards that, Mike. That sounds really neat. It sounds very character driven too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I've learned that too. Like I didn't even realize that you know, like you got to make the characters good. I think the first mm -hmm. time I sat down to write it was all about story, and uh, mm -hmm. I'd even like to go back and revamp the patience of a dead man, and and. Um, make it you know but, bring it up to date yeah but that's because you're maturing as a writer and you're seeing things that you couldn't see then right yes I mean, it's, and it's kind of like you know i started to do that with like the carpenter's farm poems and then i was like no that's kind of legacy that kind of shows me where i am now by leaving that in place i can see that i'm still getting better you know because i kind of feel like the day i stop getting better why keep doing it you know yeah. so that's yeah. a good way of looking at it. And I mean, and they're fucking good books because the, the fact of the matter is, is that your story is the characters in them. So, you know, you, you accidentally got it right there, buddy. So. Well, the, 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 the divorce part was like from the heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that started, that kicked it off, but you know, yeah, um, yeah. yeah I know what you're saying. So Sheen kind of commented on this. Why don't you talk about starting your writing career at the age you started at, because when when we did have Don Winslow on, he 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 asked me how old I was because I haven't published. I've written over 
10 books, but I haven't published anything yet. Because you, cause you look like a man baby? That long is what I was going <laughs> to say. <laughs> yeah, it's that, I know. It's, that Olaf, it's that Olaf resemblance. I need to grow the beard up. I get it, fellas. I get <laughs> it from on, the guys that work, I got to get a laughter out of there. Stop. stop <laughs> take the mute off. So, <laughs> oh, what the fuck was I going to say? <laughs> Threw me off, man. Jesus Christ. I fucked right. us up again there. <laughs> it was worth it. That was worth it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that he started right when he was in his 40s. He, he was 40, not in his 40s. Yeah, yeah. And Mike, you started when you were how old? 105. Nailed it. Oh, so 52. why don't you start talking about <laughs> Why don't you tell us about that? Because I guarantee there's a few listeners just wanting to write a book, and maybe they think, yeah, I'm too old. No, no, you're not too old. Um, you know, I wasted some money as we have spoken of in the past, you know, like you gotta, I don't have time to waste. So I, I threw a lot of, you know, savings into advertising or something, but, um, no, if you, if you're driven, I mean, if you, if this is a, this is your fun, this should be your hobby or, or, you know, hopefully a career. I mean, it's not a career for me yet, but, um, just do it, you know? I mean, I, I just got sick of seeing, like, Shane and I are old enough to have seen, all we all we see now is reboots. It's a reboot of this. It's a reboot of that. Right. Batman, right. Pet, Pet Cemetery, whatever it is. And, and, and we're freaking sick of it. So, like, we want to see something new. And so do a lot of the indie authors. I, I you know, I didn't know about that whole universe um, uh, soon enough. And um, just get out there and, and do it. And uh, any of us will help you, you know, like point you in the right direction. But you, you you definitely have to sit down and get the words on the paper first. And then, um, I mean, like, look at John Lynch. John Lynch is like a machine. He came out of yes, nowhere. He, he was like a book reviewer. And now he's like, like, he did way more as a self-publisher than I ever did. Yeah. Uh, not that I didn't very much. I'm Amazon only, and he's he's like you know he's in a couple of Barnes and Nobles or whatever, and he, you know, dealt with Ingram Spark and all that stuff. Like what a pain in the ass! Like it's so much work besides mm -hmm. the writing. It is. Yeah. Uh, there's there are some animals in self publishing though, like Michael Brent Collings. And, yeah. Um, my friend Steph Ellis also does. Duncan uh, Ralston is doing pretty well yeah. too, right? Yeah, Pro um, Stephanie like, Ellis. Yeah, Stephanie Ellis. Uh, she, I think she formatted my book. I, I didn't even know. Like, I knew that we used yeah. her, her uh, a proofreader. You know, like she's a yeah, proofreader. Yeah. And yeah. then I see Stephanie's name in in Hell on High, and I'm like, I gotta thank Stephanie, and I haven't done it yet. So she did something to my book. <laughs> um. Yeah. She. Well. She does. She does a lot for Bridges Gate. So she. She most likely formatted that thing. She most likely did the first copy read on it. You know, or the mm. copy edit on it. Um. Mm. She does a ton of stuff. Um. And bless her, she's a godsend with that stuff. Yeah. Um. Because I'm an idiot and I'm self publishing my public my poetry collection, but uh, Steph is doing a great portion of the work on that for me so yeah, yeah no that's great i mean yeah. she's she yeah. is a she's helping the community for sure yeah 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 but uh, that's what that's what india is all about those grassroots you know we're all we're all here for ourselves and for each other and that's what makes it work for us you know yeah so there's um this oh. author science fiction mainly that I forget where I read it, but Neil Gaiman had talked about him. His name's Ari Lafferty, and he lived his, you know, he, he was a, I believe, an electrician. He didn't start writing until he was retired, and he uh, wrote over 32 novels, 200 short stories, but he did very well in that field. And it's just, whether you become a big name in the field or not, it's not the point, you know. Right. Like you guys are it's saying, not. Just, just and that's it. a yeah and that's a good point too you know like mike said and like you said there's no there's never a time when it's the wrong time to start and start trying and to put yourself out there you know i did it mike did it omakatsu yep uh 55 years old when she oh, published her first novel that's a good point. you know she's a she's um, one of my favorites 
yeah she's rolling too she's doing good yeah I agree. yeah she is <laughs> so yeah i mean there's you're it's never too late man and if you if you're thinking you want to be a writer remember if you're 55 years old you're going to be dead sooner than all those young fuckers so you better get to it yeah. you know <laughs> i mean that's just the fact of it you know? unless you so, kill them all yeah yeah well there's a good plan yeah <laughs> <laughs> be be friendly and Suddenly, come along someone along. With, <laughs> somebody someone with some real logic steps into the conversation you can just waste them <laughs> <laughs> eliminate the competition and that's <laughs> when I was banned from every convention <laughs> uh, frisk that guy <laughs> <laughs> so Mike we're we're wi- winding down now and uh, we want to ask you what you're currently reading. All right. I have to apologize, but but there's like a caveat to the apology that I'm still reading Woodhaven by L.J. Doherty. Mm. And I, I apologize just because had a, I've had a month from hell. I've just been busy. And I like the story. His, his writing is smooth as silk. And I just haven't read anything. So... Another plug for L.J. Dord. I was on another podcast and I plugged it. So he deserves that because that's a good book. Hmm. Um, I'm also, my next book, or one of my next two books, one of them is going to be The Black Cabin by Wayne Fenlon. Nice. Who's a buddy. Yeah, and he's a good guy. I, what's it? Yeah, he is. And then I can't decide if I want to like paint my walls and watch it dry or read this book. <laughs> Definitely the painting one. Yeah, yeah, I'd paint the walls, um, especially watching it. So, Fernand so, Lafaro. That's yeah. a Fargo. Oh, Fardo. you get halfway through that, you're gonna paint the walls with your own brains. <laughs> what's the uh? Whoa, what's the title called? <laughs> Jesus Christ, got dark. That is um. Well, it says dreams decimated or decimated dreams. I'm just gonna, you know, it's all like the covers all messed up. I don't. This guy didn't know. More what like we're like doo doo yeah. dreams. Ha! Huh? It's okay, decimated it was, uh, dreams by yeah. friends. Did you ask him so that you could make a doo doo joke? No. <laughs> what a hack. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. I agree. We're riffing. <laughs> We're riffing here. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Mike, you're going to have to get going because the uh, the last one's out in a couple months. And um, when you get to the end of that one, you're going to want to just keep going. Trust me. All right. I will. I will. No, I, I have some time off coming up. So I hope to catch up. And you are. You know, I'll flip a coin. You or Wayne, you know, whatever. But you had me on your show, so maybe Wayne's. You know, you trust know, me. Read Wayne. I'd first. almost feel bad if Wayne. we put off Wayne. <laughs> yeah. I, everybody who met him um, when he he flew over for AuthorCon just like had the nicest things to say about him. I couldn't possibly yeah. cut yeah. cut in line with him. I'm just gonna no, let him go ahead of me. He's like he's you can tell guy. he's a saint. He's just a saint. Yeah. You know, just yeah. on, like, he saint makes Wayne. all these animations for everybody's book covers and everything. Yeah. Oh, dude, and he he passed me free graphics for my podcasts and stuff without me asking or even knowing who the fuck he was at the time that he did it. You know, that's how <laughs> yeah. I got to know him. It's like, wow, who are you? You know, did God send you? You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. He's like he's uh, like a good, good, good person. Yeah. 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 Shane, what are you currently reading? Uh, currently, something that just showed up in my mail today. Nicholas Day. Uh, it's all backwards, but it's October Animals. Oh, that looks cool. Um, I have no idea. It's a simple black hardback. I have no description. But yeah, it's cooler than shit. It's got illustrations in it. I haven't looked at the names or anything. It just wow. arrived. I'm assuming that Nick did those because he's a hell of an yeah. artist. artist so, that is good. Um, yeah. So, anyway, that's me. That's among many others. But uh, I, it would take me far too long to describe all the things I'm reading because I read about five books at a time, and I have a stack sitting in front of me that I've got off camera, so I look <laughs> organized. <laughs> <laughs> Erica, what are you currently reading? I can relate to the stack. That's what yeah. this is over here. <laughs> um, well, I just finished a book. It's also about Everest, so you might want to keep an eye on this one, too. It's called Neverest <laughs> by T.L. Bodine, Bodine, B-O-D-I-N-E. Um, that's coming out 
on oh gosh the 25th of this month is and it fiction it, yes huh. yep so i i was reading that and i was getting so excited because i was recognizing obviously like it's the same mountain but there's like you know different parts that you can actually go up yeah but seeing like the similarities between your story and hers was really cool the so, uh the, the thomas old uh, huldevelt or whatever his name is that wrote hex who also wrote yeah. a mountain climbing one called that was like a dr seuss character she just mentioned <laughs> I'm not making fun of his name by the way <laughs> but yeah you know him. Thomas old Thomas I know you say yeah, yeah. is that the way that Mike pronounced it though? That's all I was saying. I heard him on a podcast. It's Olda. Thomas yeah. Olda. I don't know the last name. Hold Hold the Okay. That's it. Yes. Close. Yes. I'm yeah, not he, cutting I, that well, out I think right it's I, it's dead fucking on until he corrects me. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan, what are you currently reading? I am reading. Last of the Ravagers by Brian Smith. Um, I love that I have, artist so fucking much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Justin King Coons. Sorry. I, yeah. No, it's cool. I thought that they weren't going to be able to get him back for the next series of uh, Splatter Westerns, but it looks like yeah. they did because they just unveiled a bunch of covers and Coons is back. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and it and whatever, you know, if they couldn't, if he was too busy. But, man, like, that's just the spirit of, of those books. Um, really is those. Is beautiful colorful covers um i have not read one of these in a while and i wanted to kind of dive back in and um i am midway through writing the next uh book in the new series and i wanted to kind of dive into one that takes place in that arizona desert type of town to get myself in the spirit uh and it is gross because it's brian smith so it you know it Mm -hmm. pushes the limits and it's yeah, exactly. It's exactly what you expect from a Brian Smith book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I also just finished Earth vs. the Lava Spiders by Candace Nola. Um, this is, uh, she worked with Judith Sonnet and Lucas Mangum. They put out three books that are like these 60 page, like 1950s B movie sci fi things. Um, and it just absolutely leans into it. It has like the fifties vernacular and the um, like the pop culture and just wall to wall cheese and blood and guts. It's exactly, you know, what you want when somebody says this is going to be like a 1950s B monster movie. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I would definitely advise people to check that one out. Patrick. Uh, so I was, reading, I was reading Mike's book and I'm uh finishing up Owen King's The Curator. It's uh, it's a mixture of like history, well, fictional history. It's like a historical fiction that's not based on like a specific event, but it's also like a mixture of a fairy tale. And mm. I kind of think of this game called Fable, but another relatable game would be like the uh, Legend of Zelda. It's just... <laughs> It's just a fun. It's a fun game, a uh, fun book. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that because there's a. It's a big book, very very dense, full of characters. Whoa! Uh, how many pages? It's like uh, wow. It's not even 500 pages, but it feels like it. Looks like more, yeah. Like back in the day, like how much was the, like the stand? The stand was like 800. <laughs> Until they made it eleven hundred, yeah. Yeah, and like even like Pet Cemetery was five hundred. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Yeah, like I mean, I, I'm just used to reading all these thick books, and and now now we see a book like that, and we're like, oh my god, look at that book. You know, <laughs> we want a novella or whatever. Yeah, yeah, novellas Crazy. are uh, hot, hot right now. So hot. So hot right now. I was going for Shane to talk. All right, Shane, we're good. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I had my uh, I had to pick up an earbud off the phone because oh. I apparently have overly large ear holes. Um. <laughs> uh. So yeah, I have no idea now. <laughs> Mike, where can people follow you? Um, I am. Uh, I'll say sleek dot bio slash Michael Clark Books, or just go to michaelclarkbooks.com. 
Shane, where can people follow you? Um, I am at Moth Frenzy on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and that's about the only social media I'm on. I am putting my uh, website, Moth Frenzy, together right now, so it's currently uh, not available to the public. You can also find me on inkheist.com. Um, again, that's a new thing, as you know, Patrick. Can I say something about that? Yeah, yeah, I, I want to yeah, yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, Ink Heist is uh, rebooting. Ink Heist 2.0 as of May 23rd. Uh, we will have hopefully Rich Duncan. That's up in the air. He was my former co-host. Um, we'll have Josh Mallerman. We'll have John Taff. And we will have uh, this Pat Rick. Don, what's that name again? Patrick who Brennan. A, who gives a fuck how you yeah, say Patrick it? Patrick Brennan, yes. Patrick <laughs> Brennan will be co-hosting this fucking thing. That guy's um, an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> that, I, I know, but I thought I'd give the prick a chance, you know. <laughs> That's what she said. Uh, <laughs> Come on, that worked, man. It did. <laughs> Okay, you know, so Erica, where can people follow you? I am excited for that though, Shane. Uh, I'm I'm honored, man. It's gonna be a blast. Yeah, absolutely. Erica, where can people follow you? Well, um, best bets just to go to my blog, ericarobinreads.com. I've got a about me page. I think it's just called about me. Um, but I have links to all my different social media, so whatever anyone is currently using instead of whatever latest one isn't working. So <laughs> I'm everywhere. <laughs> Um, may, may I interject real quick that Erica is a rock star supporter in this community. I just recently yep. started following her, and and she's your hero. Trust me. Is this your yeah. third podcast we, with me? Like on we this know. Book? Is, is it the third? I like she's she is great. I I love Erica, and my yeah. next book, Kendra is going to become Erica. Screw it. I can't wait. I hope I die. <laughs> <laughs> Is is that where she, the hanging or addiction? The what you were saying that one book you want to write about addiction? You were mentioning another. Oh one no, it's Salem not the addiction one. No, it's the hang, it's the it's the people hanging themselves in Salem one. Oh, you're gonna go pretty terribly there, Erica. <laughs> no, yeah, she's the that's... she's the the heroine. Way to fucking ruin it. So you can follow me at PR McDonough on Twitter. Follow the show at Dead Headspace on any platform except for Facebook, Brennan. Yeah. Where can people follow you? Uh, you can find me at michaelclarkbooks.com or on Twitter at Moth Frenzy. <laughs> That's it. I'm putting Patrick Brennan in the next book, too. I'm going to kill his ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, final thoughts on This Is Horror, episode 197. Uh, my house number is 197. Oh, cool. But uh, did you send me that 750 yet? Uh, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, checks in the mail. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm not going any farther with that. One. I think I have your address too. You want a T-shirt? I never uh, got you a T-shirt. I'd love, I'd love a T-shirt. I have what, a cup. And what size are you? Of, uh, large. You didn't move, did you? In the last four years? Yes, I did. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, send, me a D, send me a DM. <laughs> <laughs> I will do that. I would love a T-shirt. Yeah, no, I I have too many T-shirts. Yeah, I'm still one you, money. Yeah, preferably one you've worn. <laughs> and sweating I get, I get you a musty one yeah. <laughs> so Mr. Clarky where can people fo- uh, final thoughts Oi. <laughs> my final thoughts are <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what my final thoughts are I'm not dead yet I don't have any final thoughts I'm still Shane, living final thoughts <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know, man. I've wasted so much of your time already. It has been an honor being here. I appreciate you letting me horn in on this episode because that's exactly what I did. I said, "Oh, you're gonna have Clark let me in." (laughs) Yeah, I was like, "Okay, that was perfect." I'm glad. Erica, final thoughts. Yeah, just pleasure to talk to you again. I feel so lucky that I've got to meet you in person and talk to you virtually a bunch. And I know I've got a whole section of my shelf back there dedicated. I was trying to move my desk so you could actually see it, but I have a whole new setup and everything stuck into the walls. So that sounds work. like that sounds like bullshit. 
I'll take a picture. I'll send it to no, you guys no, right no. after. I'm, don't I'm totally placate him. <laughs> likewise. likewise. No, I've got my books. I've got Mildred. I've got the little sand from the Jaws beach. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything's in one spot. But, but. Okay. Don't, don't feed the Clark. Never feed the Clark <laughs> when it shows up at your door. It'll hang around. I can't believe Clark was just mean to you. No one's mean to Erica. Get the fuck out of here, mister. Yeah. <laughs> don't be protective. I love her, too. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh who was i asking a question to brennan Bre- Bre- final thoughts oh, yeah, brennan, yeah. Thanks, he's, he's asked final well, thoughts like three times in a row <laughs> shane do you have any final thoughts uh, I, I th- i've already answered that question twice now brennan Go final thoughts. Patrick, thought. where can people follow you <laughs> <laughs> at erica robin books.com my final thoughts right. are uh you know, we, we were talking about how, hey, it's been three, four years since, you know, we all kind of discovered each other and we have a new Mike Clark book and Ink Heist is coming back. So it feels like we're right back where we started. This is brilliant. <laughs> I love it. My um, cheeks are hurting. Hold on. What's old is new. That's the catch line. The I'm going to go with that because that means I get to live longer. Because <laughs> yeah, we yeah, are old. There you go. <laughs> So uh, I appreciate everybody's time. You know, Mike, thanks for hanging out. Shane, thank you for joining us. And I'm I'm Pleasure. to see you relaunching in Kaist, man. Like yeah. Pat said, that was uh kind of discovering this community. That was that was a big <laughs> you sold you sold me a lot of books early <laughs> yeah. on there. <laughs> that's uh that's my favorite thing to do is sell other people's books. Yep. It makes me feel like I'm doing something because I can't sell my own fucking books. <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway um shutting up now but i i love every single one of you guys uh erica it is a pleasure to meet you um and thank you for everything you do for this community my honor to be here i thought she was gonna talk that's very sweet of you shane i start panicking i start sweating and then i can't (laughs) (laughs) my my final thoughts are my cheeks legit hurt from uh laughing and smiling so that's a sign of uh just like you guys said, being comfortable around each other. And aren't you going to yeah. have another yeah. baby? I am. It's another boy. Oh, uh, yeah. I saw the ultrasound, man. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you. Uh, August 12th is the due date. Nice. I'm excited. Every, yeah. Everybody says those ultrasounds are beautiful, but only to the parents, man, to the rest of us. <laughs> still congratulations. <laughs> All the same good work. <laughs> <laughs> Next episode is 198 with Candice Nola. She's finally getting her solo episode. So stay tuned for that. Um, and also, there's two books out by her. Uh, the Unicorn Killer. Two new books by her. Mm-hmm. The Unicorn Killer and uh, The Generator. Brandon, I can't remember on the she top of She's everywhere head. all of a sudden to me. I, I think I watched her on one of your episodes with uh, Caitlin Marceau or something, and then I start seeing her everywhere. Like she's Talk about from- horn in. She's going to be in the fucking lineup next year. Nice. Yeah, oh. She's like the number 23. Yeah, we can't say no to her, Erica. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she was, uh, she's entertaining. <laughs> well. You know that you you know the uh, outro. You have many choices in podcasts. Thanks for watching. This is our. No, that's not it. Okay, you have many choices in podcasts. Thanks for being a part of Inkeist. That was that was brave trying it again when it didn't work the first time. <laughs> you made choices in podcasts. Thanks for picking us, motherfuckers.